All right, everybody, welcome to Code Akron Q&A. My name is Kevin Lockett. Uh, for most of you, don't, does anybody know what Code Akron is? Have you heard of Code Akron? Peter knows. Uh, Code Akron is an organization that I started. Uh, I want to start a series of workshops. Um, I, I kept on reading about the digital divide and the lack of diversity in a lot of tech companies across the country. And I figured, well, I can try to do something here in Akron. So the goal is to uh, connect youth, urban youth, and minority professionals to the tech scene and startup scene in Akron. So we did a couple of programs last year, and uh, which is basically for kids, and we'll have some things for kids coming up later this year. We also want to do more things with the adults in, in for this year. So I'm going to have hopefully two of these. Uh, the next one probably won't be until the fall, because in between we'll have the kids stuff in between. So thank you everyone for uh, showing up. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my sponsors. I want to thank the Launch League, who partnered with me on these events so far. We've done three of these, so that's Thank you for them. Uh, OSC Tech Lab, of which we're here, which is also part of the Launch League. Uh, Fire Pizza, who's next door, they donated all those pizzas over there, which is fantastic. Uh, yeah, yeah, fantastic. So uh, it'll be great. So I want to thank all our sponsors, and most of all, I want to thank all of you for showing up. So thank you. You have to come here, but I'm glad you're here. So today we are talking to Roger Riddle from Unbox Akron. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello, people. Uh, so I kidded Roger because uh, I told him I found information about you in Akron since he's, you know, since he relocated from Macon. I found a lot of information about him when he was in Macon, but he was born in, in Detroit. So I was going to ask him, I was going to ask him how many people he killed in Detroit, but I think that would be kind of rude. <laughs> so tell him why. <laughs> because, you know, you're a witness protection. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided not to ask him about his witness protection life. So he, he claimed there's information on me in Akron, there's information on me in Macon. There was nothing there's about nothing. Detroit. There's nothing about you in Detroit. He was like, no matter how hard I searched, I just couldn't find nothing on, in, on you about Detroit. Right. But I did find something about him in Detroit. And, and, and uh, <laughs> uh, it will start, we'll start off this way. So you actually made a mixtape about Detroit. When you were Macon, uh, you went back to Detroit you know, kind of see how your hometown was, and you had you created a mixtape of your, the songs that influenced your life. And you had Run DMC, you had Public Enemy, um, you had Yaz, and the City. But it, yeah, it was very kind of tech. Yeah, yeah. Like early tech yeah. and, and hip hop. Yeah. yeah, but there's one song uh, I wanted to ask you about, which kind of stood out to me. Um, you also put in uh, I Need a Freak by Sexual Harassment. <laughs> <laughs> What kind of, what, how did that uh, impact your life as a child? <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I remember the, the kind of like the, the baseline and how dark it was. And it, it, always, it was always a song that stood out to me. And we had a DJ named the Electrified Mojo in Detroit. And he would come on late at night. And, you know, anything goes, it was a lot of funkadelic, a lot of prints. And I remember hearing that song like late in the middle of the night. I would stay up and listen to the show. And hearing it, and it was so different from everything else that that, was, that I was hearing at the time. That it just stuck with me, and I was, I had always wanted to, you know, like you said, because it's, because of the content of it. There's never a good time to work that song in, so so that was about my only chance to ever to play that song in the mix. Right. Well, I, was, I was shocked. I was like, oh, I need a freak. Okay. So we're going to get into uh, Rogers. We're going in the beginning of this. We're going to kind of talk about who Roger is. And then we're going to get into more of the marketing side of things with Unbox. So, um, you have a friend named Flaco Torres yes. right, back in Macon. And he wrote an article about you saying goodbye. Saying goodbye to Roger Riddle is bittersweet. Because I think people really, you were a true Renaissance man in, in, in Macon. Um, you were uh, director of marketing uh, for the Moon Hanger. Uh, you helped with the Soapbox Derby down there. You kind of you co founded a soccer club. You, did a lot of entertainment writing. You, you did a lot of different things there. Um, what did making give to you as a person and as a professional? Making was a small town. We were about we were ninety eight thousand people, and there are a lot of parallels between Macon, Akron, and Detroit in terms of you know the city at one point boomed and, and there was a lot going on and then over the years, the, around the 70s, you see the decline uh, of all of these cities. So there was, there was a lot that I found in common there from, from home and, there, and once I got here, I saw the parallels here again. Um, but because it was such a small town, it was a good place to test things out. 
So a lot of the stuff that I've learned that I'm applying here with Unbox were things that I first, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was giving it a shot down there. And the ability to be able to get in touch with, um, like you said, like to write for the newspaper, to work on radio shows, to work on TV shows, and to learn how those things function and then turn around and be able to apply them here. Like, more than anything else, that's what it gave me. Also, it gave me a great, uh, a great base of friends because there were a lot of good people that I met down there who were very active. They wanted to do things to make their community come alive. And then I get here, and it's full of people like that. So it was just kind of like I was ready to jump in. Like, like I was saying before before we started rolling, like I want to get this where I wanted to be so I can jump in and team up with some folks to do some stuff here like I was doing down there. Right. So how does social media play into this? Because um, with Moonhanger, you were also in charge of digital content. Right. So like you said, you can experiment a lot in making. So what type of things did you do down there uh, that helped you uh, get a grasp of social media? And how does that help you appear when using Unbox, um, using social media with Unbox? Um, we, one of the things that, that I learned because how I ended up doing the marketing job for the Moonhanger Group. The Moonhanger Group was a restaurant group. Um, we had three, four, four restaurants, a concert venue, which was a theater. It was like a, a classic theater that had been renovated. You kind of think think the Civic Theater here, but on a smaller smaller basis. Um, and we had a catering business and. You know, I was handling the social media for all of those. So what I learned was kind of how you are, the ins and outs of Facebook, and what you're doing with Facebook, what's going on with Facebook, and you know, if you've heard talk of the algorithm, the Facebook algorithm, and how if you have a business page, you know, you can post to your business page, and maybe you aren't really getting the following. So I had to learn how that algorithm comes into play when you're making a post on what actually happens. What should you do? What I learned was you need to kind of, you need to do a bunch of things. You can do just a text post, see how your readers, your the people who follow you respond to that. Do a post with a link in it, see how they respond to that. Do a post with a picture, see how they respond, and then start to mix it up. Do a picture with the link. So don't let the link box show, but do a picture, see how that responds. Over time, they've kind of changed things. Right now, Facebook is very video driven. They want you to post videos. So, you know, they're going to show more of, if you post a video, more of your followers are likely to see it. But also what happens is, as people like or comment or share, they start to see more of your stuff. If they like more of your pictures, they're going to see more of your pictures come through. So you want to mix these things up. Those are things that I've learned. Also, the back end advertising wise, when you do a Facebook ad, um, there's a lot of things that that I ended up learning how to do. Um, you want to, you can target an ad so close, you can get really, really close to the people who you want to reach through a Facebook ad. And initially, our way of doing it was to do to boost a post and it used to be a time where you would boost a post and the, pe the people who like your page see the post then it got to a point where you can expand out you can say like well hey I want the whole state of Ohio or I want just the city of Akron or I want you can say like I want certain states if you know who you're marketing to you can narrow it down you can say like hey I want only the people who have an iPhone to see this or I want you know I specialize if I'm a, a novelist, I want people who read books and read certain type of books or read certain authors. You can tell them, like, go after the people. And so now you're, you're starting to narrow it down. You're getting closer and closer to the demographic who is in your market, the people that you're going after. Those are things that I've learned. And now what you want to do is um, you can... You can... Do a content, this is this is probably the most important thing about a Facebook book ad right now. If you do a blog post and there's a link in the blog post, or you, you get someone to go from the link on Facebook to your blog post, you should there's a pixel and the pixel allows them to record who goes to your website. You put this in the back end and you're programming on your website and they'll say, okay, well, 
we know now this person has been by. So instead of just doing an ad that blasts open, open to whoever's out there, even if you've narrowed it down, now you know that they went to your web page, they're interested, and you can tell that ad only show to people who've already been to my website and looked at this page. So you're getting even, you know they're already interested in you, and so now you can make, you're even getting closer to that sale because, you know, you keep showing them like, hey, remember? Remember you went, you looked at this? So they're more likely to buy because they're, you know they're interested because they went to the, they went to your website. So those are kind of the things I've learned along the way and how I'm applying it now here. So like I said, so Bacon was fantastic for you, but one day your, your friend, Chris Horn, who you were friends with Bacon, had moved here to Akron. Right. Now, before Chris moved to Akron, did you know anything about Akron? Before Chris moved to um, My father was a truck driver for Roadway Express. Mm -hmm. And I, what I knew about Akron was that the headquarters of Roadway was here. That's, that's all I really, really knew about Akron. How long did you, how long did you drive a truck? Oh, man. Um, he retired in 97. And, man, I want to say like, he probably drove a truck for like 25, 30 years or something like that. Did you ever want to drive a truck? Uh, really, I think I like briefly kind of thought about it, but just I think I was more so interested in the traveling than the actual truck driving. Uh, I I wanted it as opposed to making that long haul. And I'll tell you, I drove like driving the U-Haul truck from making the Akron was no fun. I wouldn't have survived <laughs> as a um, as a long haul driver. It's interesting, you know, because we're going to we'll get to unbox in a second. I know so many people who moved from Akron to Atlanta or Akron to Georgia. You're like the first person, <laughs> and Chris is like the first people I know who actually moved from Georgia to Akron. Like usually it's been the complete opposite for, for many years. I've heard a lot of it's kind of like, oh my God, you moved here? Why? Why did you do it? But I, I um, as I was saying, saying before we got started, I'm excited about Akron. I, I'm, I'm excited about a lot of things that I see. There, are, There's a lot of different things going on that to me looks like growth in the city that I didn't see him making. And um, be, I was talking to a guy who said like, you know, I'm an older dude, and when I look at these buildings around town that are empty, I look at them and I see what used to be there. And you guys, you younger folks, without, you're full of ideas and you're full of, full of passion. You look at these empty buildings, see what may be. And so there's a mindset for a lot of people, they are looking at these buildings or they're looking at the city and seeing what it used to be and not really looking for a future while I'm coming in looking for that future, which gives me an opportunity to kind of grab things and shape them and point them in different directions and, and hopefully, you know, I get to stick around and do a lot of that here. Right. So Chris contacted you one day while you were making and said, listen, I have an idea for uh, the Dove Strip, I have an idea for a newspaper. I think, did you talk about a box at that time? Not at that time. No. So Chris, Chris and I both worked for a wrote for a newspaper that was similar to what the Double Strip is now. It's called the Eleventh Hour. It's the the alternative newspaper there in Macon, and um, we loved it. It was a lot of fun. It was what you picked up because the daily newspaper wasn't going to do the stories on the bands and on the restaurants, the people that we knew that were doing actually on the ground doing things. Their story wasn't getting told. This was the only place that was telling those stories at the time. And Chris was writing for him, and then he became the editor for the newspaper. So when he left and he moved up here, he initially started working for a television station in Cleveland. And then he he decided, like, he just wasn't happy. He was doing the social media for a television station in, in Cleveland. He wasn't happy, and he was like, you know, I really want to do this newspaper. And he mentioned it to me, like, I, you know, I, I'm going to get it started. Of course, I was like, I knew he was good. I was like, go for it, man, do it. Like, I'm sure you'll, you'll enjoy it, and you'll, you'll get it rolling. And he did that, and then, I want to say maybe it was about six, seven months in on that, he contacted me. At first he contacted me and said, I got an idea for a subscription box. I want to do a subscription box, but I'm not exactly sure what I should do. And because he was a writer, I said, well, hey, what about a writer's box? I've not seen one of those. What would a writer want to get each month? Right, how, would you, how would you appeal to a writer? And we kind of left it at that. And then the next thing, next time he contacted me, he said, I'm a finalist for a grant for the subscription box, and it's going to be all about Akron. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then the next thing I know, he was like, I got it. You want to come work on it? And I was like, yeah, man, I'm on my way. Like, that, sounds, that sounds fantastic. Plus, I was, 
I had gotten kind of bored with making, I felt like I had done as much as I could do and couldn't move forward anymore. I was still doing things, but I wasn't seeing kind of that next step up or to moving on to the next thing. It was just kind of like, I had a baseline and couldn't get any further than that. So I packed up and, and headed up here and you know wasn't quite sure what I was getting myself into, but I knew I enjoyed working with Chris and I knew that this was, you know, it was going to be a lot of fun. So it was going to be something new and different. I could try my hand at it. And it was marketing, which is something that I was already doing. So, right. so we talked before we, we started here, we were talking about subscription boxes. And it's, it's a growing industry in a lot of ways. Because I, there's a there's so many subscription boxes I like uh, because they give you like a pair of socks and ties every month uh, for a fee. And there's Loot Crate. Loot Crate is a, is a geeky type of box where they send you geeky things. They have a theme every month. But like for 20 bucks, you get a bunch of box, box of stuff. So you have to unbox. A box is different because it's localized. Right. While these other companies are national. So in a lot of ways, what was the marketing plan for Unbox? Because now you're trying to convince uh, Akronites to buy a box of stuff, you know, being in Akron, which uh, people should jump on that, but it's, it's new. It's, it's new. We don't have subscription boxes here. Most most cities don't have subscription boxes. So what was the marketing plan like to to attract an audience to convince them, hey, we've got cool stuff here in Akron. You know, and just to pay a fee and get these things. Um, there are a couple of cities that I've run across that have subscription boxes. There's a Baltimore box, and there's an Austin box. And of course, we looked at them and we were kind of saying, like, how do you know? How do they do what they do? How do they pull it off? And a lot of what we found was that it's about a sense of pride in these cities. And once you tap into that pride then you're starting down that route. So if there's, um, for us, what we needed was, we need people who love Akron, was kind of our large demographic. We need people who love Akron. And we looked at two different groups. There are gonna be a group of people who live here in the city, and there are gonna be a group of people who live outside the city. And maybe they miss home, and you wanna send them a box that says like, hey, this is what's going on at home. And it's really easy to do the things that everyone knows, but once you, you know, once you get the stuff that everyone knows, once you get these things, then you're, you're kind of done. You've already, you know, it, you know, it's fun at first, you open it up, but you're like, I already know this stuff. So we were kind of like, well, we want to introduce them to something new. And what did we appreciate? Well, we looked at, we were lucky in the sense that Chris was publishing the Delta Strip. He had, he had a, a following already that you could, talk to and look at how they responded to different parts of the paper. Well, we knew that people were really into the music scene around here. We knew that people were in the art. We knew um, different little things that, you know, wildly we, we would pay attention to. Like, if, I, if Chris made a post about Lawson's chip dip, it went crazy. We were like, what is it about this chip dip that everybody loves? Well, it's, it, it's a reminder of their childhood. You know, a lot of people think like, this is this is something that was a piece of my childhood, and you know you start to look at those things like people want to remember, you know things that are good. So let's maybe it's not all new. You throw in something, people have a, a sense like people love the history of Akron. Like if you post an old picture, and people get to say like, oh well, you know I know where that is. That's you know at such and such street. Now this building is there, or this business is there now, and that's what it used to look like. So, you know, okay, we want to tie in music, we want to tie in art, we want to tie in history. We want to introduce you to new businesses that maybe do things similar to those businesses that you love. So you're going to be like, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know that this existed. And that was how we were focusing, like, how we were going to get this box of people and get people interested in it. It was kind of like, we're going to tie all these things together. One of my favorite things that we did was, one month we did, a set of rubber duckies in the box, like bath toys, like little rubber ducks. And the reason behind this was the rubber ducks were holding bowling balls and bowling pins. Awesome. And so we were kind of like, what um, did you know? Like we do a little booklet that talks about everything. It's like, did you know the rubber duck as a toy was first created and manufactured in Akron in the 50s. At the same time in the 50s, the Pro Bowling Association was founded in Akron. So you tie these two things together and you pull it out and hopefully you look at them like, why are these rubber ducks in there? And then you look at the book and you're like, oh my God, I didn't know that. And then you turn around and you tell somebody else, it's like, you know, one day maybe in conversation, somebody's like, hey, you want to go bowling? And you're like, did you know 
how did you know? And he was, we hope that's the type of response we're getting out of people. And um, the first one we did, I actually forgot to put the trivia in there. We put a bunch of dumb, dumb suckers in the box. And, and then I didn't say anything about it. We were like, I wonder if anybody understood why those dumb dumbs were in there. But we found out that dumb dumbs were created by the Akron Candy Company. So we do little fun things like that along with the fact that we're saying, like, hey, there are these new businesses. So here, here's a photographer maybe you've never heard of. And, you know, we do a set of postcards and, and maybe it's from a photographer. Uh, um, last month we worked with the library special collection to do vintage pictures of old restaurants. So t once again, tying back into that history, it's kind of like, oh, I remember Yakimini's. I used to eat here as a kid. Or, I've never heard of Marcel's. What was that? And there's a little bit of info on the back of the postcard. And then you get to write on that postcard, put it in the mail, and send it to somebody. And then, you know, hey, you moved away from Akron. Look at this. And you're kind of like, and of course, the Unbox logo is on there. And UnboxAkron.com is on there. So hopefully you're leading that person this way back to you. Yeah, so how does feedback work? Because you have to gauge how people are either liking the box, not liking the box, what they like to see different. So how do you guys, do you use social media, do you use surveys, I mean, do you do mailing cards? I mean, how do you get a feedback to find out how, uh, how, how, how the box is engaging and connecting with people? So, I, and I'm, I'm about to give away, give away some of my secrets. We aren't even there yet. And this is something <laughs> that, that we're going to, but hopefully, you know, I, I hope you all want to know these things. So, um, we start out, we've been doing, doing some, um, Surveys, and we kind of ask, like, "Hey, is this, which of these items that were in your box, in this box, were your favorite?" And you know, you could vote on them, and we'll see like what level, like what what people were into, what they were, and there's kind of a range of things. It wasn't always what we expected, and then you'll know, say, "Well, what was which of these items that were in here is the first time you've heard it?" And then you ask a few other questions, but now we've been. I bought a subscription to. Ladies Birch Box, if you're familiar with Birch Box, Birch Box is $10, you get a box that has like makeup and lotion and just kind of samples. And you get like five or six, and you know, everybody was like, you know they make a Birch Box for men, don't you? And I was like, yeah, I do. But I also happen to know that the majority of our subscribers are women. So a lot of women buy Birch Box. When I hear ladies talk about subscription boxes, they're talking about Birch Box. And I wanted to know, I, what is the experience like for a lady who gets birch box? And so I got it, and actually Nick's wife saw it come in. She was like, oh my God, who got birch box? And so I was like, well, sit down, open this box, and let me watch you open it. And so she opened it up, and she started talking about everything. So I was taking note of, like, what, what is it like for this lady who obviously likes this box, and she gets excited over it. What, 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 what's the experience for her? And what I found out that Birchbox does is along with their survey, they'll say, okay, I want you to use the product and then come to our website and fill out a survey about the product. Tell me what you liked, what you didn't like. And then I'm sure Birchbox turns around and gives that information that they collect from their subscribers back to the manufacturer and say, here, here's the data on what we collected. And what to entice the person to take the survey and say, if you you do, let's say you're subscribing and you get five things in the box, we need you to fill out six surveys, so you need one more, you gotta get the box another one, and you get $10 that you can apply to your account. And they sell, so like you get a sample, but they also sell like the larger sizes. So if you like something, you get this $10, you're, you're gonna buy another box, you're gonna make sure your subscription rolls over, and you're gonna fill out all of this information that they can then turn around and give back to their manufacturers and then they, then you got ten dollars that you can spend. Of course, ten dollars isn't paying for much of anything. Maybe you can use it for another month's subscription. But if you have to buy, buy find a product that you want to buy, that ten bucks you got to throw in probably another fifteen to get the full size thing. So these are all kind of things. It's like, well, we've been wondering like all of these the businesses that we put in this box. They want to know. They want to know who they, you know, who we've reached and what they thought. I was like, it would be fantastic for us to kind of do the same thing. If we lead you, we're going to ask you to fill out a survey anyway. Well, hey, like, you know, we can we can do the exact same thing. So that's where we're headed next is to collect this data and then turn around and give it back to these businesses here so they can work on improving their um, the, the items that, that they make. And then kind of the same thing, like we can offer a bonus like, hey, you know, if you fill out so many, maybe it goes towards off your 
off the next month's subscription or something like that. We haven't figured all of that out yet, but that's kind of the route we're headed in. So you also do some cross-promotion things, cross-platform things. Uh, you have unboxing events uh, where you go to different places. So how does that work exactly? Does there a place of contact you? Do you contact a place saying, hey, you like to reveal our next month's box? I mean, how does that go every month? Um, we, we contact them. A lot of them are people that we've met along the way. And you know, Chris may have had a relationship with them with the Double Strip. Maybe they're an advertiser, and, and you know, it's a restaurant or a bar that are kind of new. Not a lot of people know. And one of the things we want people to do is kind of they, we want them to explore and learn different things about Akron. And um, that's a piece of it, taking them somewhere that they've never been before. And we try to move it around so it's not always. We don't always want to come to a place downtown. We want to. We don't always want to end up in Highland Square. You know a lot of these the places there. We want to. One of the places we did was the old 97 out in Kenmore, and people walked in and was like, "Oh my God, this place is gorgeous!" And I never think to come over to Kenmore. I'm glad you came. I think you brought us out here. So we'll contact them and say, "Hey, you know, we want to." We want to do a pickup party where the members can get their boxes. Some members want to pick up their box instead of us putting it in the mail. And you get it a couple of days earlier than, than the people who were getting it in the mail. And it's fun in the sense that you get to open them up with other people. So it's more, you know, it's you and, and some people you know, and you're all opening your boxes together and who and I as you're pulling the stuff out, which we accomplish two things. You know, there's this sense of community in that I get to meet other people that are like me who subscribe and then I also we also get to introduce them to a place that maybe they've never been to before. Right. There's a lot of human behavior in this. But it kinda of goes comes back to DJing because as a DJ you have to make sure everyone watching the dance floor or playing your music, if people are coming to the dance floor for songs that you're playing, it's gonna be a long night. Yes. But at the same time you wrote something a long time ago where you said that you played a lot of hits, like 70s, 80s songs, but you're almost retired. <laughs> Just because you're getting bored, like the fans, like the people on the dance floor liked it, but you were getting bored. So, how, as a marketer, do you find that level where you're giving the audience what they want, but at the same time you want to keep on pushing the envelope and, and stay creative, just trying to balance the two? Uh, it, it was kind of what I was saying earlier: is you, you find those things that you know people like. I'm not a man. I'm really not opposed to playing the hit song that everyone recognizes. Just don't want to play. I want to play the hit song three times in the night. I want to play that that same song every time I go out. I wouldn't want to put. I want to one day have Swinsons in the box, but I don't want Swinsons something representing Swinsons in every box because, like I say, you get bored. But it's also recognizable. It's fun to say like, "Oh, I love this." So how do you do it in a creative way? And a lot of the things that I, that we kind of think about is how do you make each thing that's in this box is kind of like a business card or a calling card for the company. You want the you want whoever opens this box to be introduced to something in a creative way. So a lot of times we'll talk to a business and say like, okay, well, what are you trying to do? Do you want to introduce yourself to new customers, or do you want to look? You got a slow night. Maybe we should, we should look at a slow night. How do we get people on this? Get people to you on this slow night, or you know, if you want to sell your product, how do we do something creative in a way? And so if there's a lot of interaction with with the company to say like, what do you think? You know, how do how should we go about this? And also the idea of tying it all together with a theme. So like February's box was the big blimpin' box, and we talked all about blimps. Um, March's box was the snack room box, and we talked about snacks. So tying maybe something that's familiar with something that's new, and tying all of that together in a package becomes a lot of fun. And, you know, you have to think creatively on how you're going to make all these things work together in this box. So that that's probably the best way to say like, it's cool to include something that everyone knows. Just don't overdo it, and then also do it in a creative way, a new way, something that maybe they haven't done before. Um, pair up with them and say, like, let's create some brand new. Like, maybe, yeah, maybe you got a keychain, but let's figure out a way to do something that your customers haven't seen and our folks wouldn't expect. 
So how do you go about finding people to, to add things to the box? I mean, do people submit things to you, or do you get the payment walking around Akron, or do you go on websites? What, what's the process of sewing something, something to, to the box at home? Yes, it's all. <laughs> it's every bit of yes. that. I, I've just walked in places, looked around, and said, man, this is cool. I want to work with you, give them a business card, and, like tell them what we do. I've had people call me and say, I want to be in the box here. Take this, put it in the box. I've, I've called people and say, like, I understand you can't give me, you know, a hundred pieces of something to go in this box. You know, can I buy it from you at a wholesale or maybe some at cost? Maybe, you know, a lot of times people are looking at it as a marketing expense. Sometimes, you know, people are saying like, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm so small, I can't really do that. But, and you find a way to work it that's unique enough and it's creative enough and that, you know, there's a lot of something, it, there's something there that you want to, you want people to see and get to know. We were lucky in the sense that we got that grant from the Knight Foundation, so we have a little bit of capital to kind of push things along. So we can say like, okay, well, you know, we can do this at wholesale for you, or a bigger company comes along and it's like, they got a little bit of a marketing budget, they can cut us a little bit of a deeper discount, which allows us to put a little bit more with these smaller places that, um, that aren't as well known. Um, but it really is kind of like calling folks, emailing people, just, you know, every sense of contacting and not being worried. Sometimes they say no, sometimes they ignore you, sometimes they're like, hell yeah, I'm gonna, I want to be in the box like they've heard about it and they're excited. And a lot of times people don't understand, you have to explain it, and they have to see it, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, this is really cool. But, you know, you never know, you never know what, what you're doing. Until, the, until you're talking to them, and it just, it just doesn't hurt to talk. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the platform for a second. You made a mixtape, uh, Watts mixtape, uh, called All Acting All the Time. Yes. Where you highlighted uh, a lot of music acts in Acting. Uh, let's go back to music for a second. Uh, you've been making, making, uh, making had a little cool music scene down there, and you're from Detroit, and that's legendary when it comes to music. How does, what, what do you think of the Acting music scene, how does it compare to some of the other areas that you live in? Actually, I love Acting's music scene. Like, because of the fact that I made that mixtape and then I also made one, one of the favorite things that I've done so far that went in the box was a, an Akron download card. So I, worked, I contacted the, a bunch of different musical acts around town and was like, hey, I want to do an Akron download card. It's like a compilation. You know, back in the day you would have done a compilation album or a CD or something like that. Now you can put it on a card and you know you take the code, you go to a website, you type in your code, and you download these ten songs. So I got with ten different Akron bands and was like, let me use one of your songs from your album. All these people already had like MP3s on Bandcamp or C D Baby or something like that. And I was like, you know, I love what you do and I and luckily, Chris, I had this idea that I wanted to do. If anyone is familiar with um, a good day in Harlem, the, the photograph, it's like all of the jazz musicians on the stoop. I, I wanted to do, I wanted to recreate that picture for Macon with Macon musicians. And I could never pull it off. And I told Chris about this when we lived in Macon. I was like, look, I love this photograph and I want to do it. I want to do it in Macon. We can never make it happen. Chris starts to double strip and he does something similar. He sends me this picture and was like, look, and it was just this huge picture full of people with like drums and guitars and basses and horns and I was like, this is incredible, I can't believe it. But what he did out of that was he built a file of every band that came in and, and was in that picture, everybody. It was like what kind of music it was, what their website was, what their phone number was. So he gave it to me and I started going through it, pulling up and listening to stuff and I was like, oh my God, like Akron's music scene is all over the place. It's like, you know, like there's some folk music, here's some hip hop, here's you know, there's here's some rock and roll, here's some heavy metal, here's like a Cajun band, here's some, oh, tons of jazz. I was so, so surprised by the amount of jazz. So I started contacting people, and it was kind of the same thing as I was saying earlier. Like some people didn't understand what I was saying, just didn't respond, and it was just kind of like, no, I'm not interested. But the people who did, you know, were were a lot of fun, and I ended up making that mixtape as a way of pulling together everyone saying like this you know I, I made this mix and everyone started sharing it and I was like now I need some songs I want to make this download card and everybody was like yeah use this use this here take take this song and I put together the download card and put it in the box and it was it was a lot of fun I got art on the card from a local artist his name is um, Maximando Rivera who works at Urban Eats 
and then turned around and put the cards in the box. The extras I had, I gave them back to each each artist. I gave them a stack of the cards and said, like, here, you know, here's a stack of cards you can hand out. Of course, the card has the Unbox Acro logo on it, and we got it sponsored by the Big Love Fest. We were working with them, and so I'm like, but oh, we'll put your logo on it. And basically, I was talking to Zach, and was kind of like, help me find some bands, send some people to me. So that's something that I want to do over and over again as well because there are so many bands here and I, you know, you, I would love to get to a point where I can do one of those every month and as people put out new music, maybe you can get one song off a new album and, and that's a good way of building the music community, building my connection with the music community and hopefully getting them to help spread the message as I'm spreading their message. Every company in Fitch used to do that, I think. They used to have like a CD of dance music. I think that was them. Did they really? I think so. Well, I'm just even if it's some music that was Yeah, is this the card you're talking about? The download? Yes. Yeah, so, so this is the download card he was talking about. So it's a cool card. Who made this card? Dropcards.com. And you can do more than just music. Like, you could download, if you wanted to do art, like you could do a portfolio of art and artists on this download card. Like it doesn't have to be music, it could just be a collection of files. Um, there and you know, there's it, it didn't cost a whole lot either. It was I can't quite remember the price, but I remember I was blown away. I, I got five hundred of these cards for very cheap. It, it, it might have been like around a hundred dollars. So how important are partnerships when it comes to a uh, new business, or this business in general, um, developing relationships that can also help you with your product? How, how far partners, partnerships have been so far in my months? Wow. We, actually, like, it's, it's been great because you have to look at every business that we work with, you're building a partnership. And um, how do you, you know, you want to make sure you take care of them. You, you do them right because they're they're putting their time and effort into giving you something to go in the box. You want to make sure you treat it kindly and and show it off in the best possible way, so that people when they open the box they get excited by it. Hopefully they in turn head to their the business's website and get some more information. But what we started to do is each month when we do a box, all of the businesses that we work with, we do a profile on the business that we then post our website. So a little more information because, you know, we're planning for 135 members for the April box. We're, we're, we're gonna ship out 135 boxes. That's a small number compared to our reach on social media and our reach through um, the Devil Strip. So if I can do something where I write a small article that gives a little light towards these businesses and then share it through our social media channels. They feel the added, added value in that I'm reaching an even wider audience now. Like, yes, it's great that, you know, right now we're only, we're only at 135 boxes. That's not, that's kind of, you know, it's big for the boxes when you, especially when you're talking about a small business to say, I need 150 or something. Like for a small business, that's you know that's that's a large number, but that's not a huge number in terms of reach. That's not something that's going to, you know, they're going to go to work the next day and you know there's a line waiting outside outside of the store or anything like that. But if you can turn around and then say like, okay, these 135 people got it, but we got an article that now may have reached 2,000 people. Like that's 2,000 eyes that that got on you that maybe. Those people have never heard you before. That's that little added extra benefit. And we hope in turn that they get excited about the fact that that's out there and then they share it with their their um, followers so that we get it back from them. So there's that reciprocal on both both ends and just kind of showing them that like, hey, we really do want to promote the things that are here in Akron and make Akron special. Yeah, I was going to ask you about expanding the audience uh, just because the bulk of the audience is coming from the Delta what if a person doesn't do the double strip? Um, how do you reach out to them, connect with them, just kind of broaden your audience to try to get the box out to more people? And oddly enough, Chris and I were, we just had this conversation. This is something that we hadn't done. And we were we kind of looked at each other and was like, how did we miss this? We have a newspaper 
and not once have we run an ad for unboxing it. And really? we just lost <laughs> it. We just <laughs> lost it. Like, like, we were embarrassed by each other. Like, we were sitting there like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Well, that's why this is my figure. No, we, 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 we had like, like, we will share each other's stuff through, like, the unboxed social media channel. I'll make sure that, like, when something comes up on Double Stroke, like, I'll share it. And, they, and the Double Stroke will share it, unboxed and stuff. But we have never. And so now, actually, what this is something new for us going forward was kind of like, we're going to start running an ad in the double strip that's kind of like just pictures of like, here's what you missed last month in Unbox, and then a brief like maybe 500 word column where I do kind of highlight really quickly everyone that was in that box. Like, here, you know, here are these businesses and kind of look at it from a business perspective. Like, these are businesses around Akron that maybe you aren't familiar with. And that's kind of how we're going to approach that. But for us, like we've been building a, um, <laughs> we've been building Unbox almost separate from the double strip. While while like there's an obvious tie each month, I put a double strip in the box, like the copy of the paper. I put the paper in the box because you never know if the people who are reading, the people who are getting Unbox, actually pick up a copy of the double strip and read it. And so we tie those two together, and we do. Promotional items, like if I make pins, stickers, stuff like that, a lot of times, you know, I'll do one for Unbox, do one for the Double Strip as well. Um, there are those ways in which we're kind of branding the two together to kind of realize, like, hey, you know, they, these are two separate businesses, but they, they're kind of tied together. This is sister corporations. Um, but it's small, I mean, you have a small staff. I mean, it's just like a, this. Yeah. It's me, I have a young lady named Rachel who works with me, and that's Unbox. And then there's Chris who, you know, but his focus is on the newspaper. And, you know, we got to, Chris and I chat back and forth, but for the most part, I find the, I find the things that go in the box, I pack the box, I ship the box. I, I, I've got my hands on every piece of it. There's nothing. Rachel helps me write the profiles of the businesses, and we sit down and we talk ideas. Like, we start looking at the months going forward, and we say, like, okay, well, what businesses have you run across? What have I run across? And it helps a lot to have someone else to talk with about what you're doing. Because if it was up to me, I, like, if you ask me what restaurant I want to go to, I'm going to say Nepali Kitchen. And I'm going to say Nepali Kitchen almost every time. I'm like, I, I love Nepali Kitchen. But until, you know, Rachel will say, like, today we went to Elgato because she, for whatever reason, she loves Elgato. And we was like, yeah, you know, let's do that. Because not that I don't like Elgato, I do. I just never think about it. My favorite restaurants, I, I like the Bali Kitchen, I like Thai Bowl, I like Diamond Deli, and I will keep going to those three or else I'll go home and cook myself. But it, it helps to have that sounding board of someone that you can talk to, to say like, I have these ideas, and say it to them and see what ideas that they come up with based on your ideas. And you never know, you start to expand like that. So, what's, so, so, so since you're balancing so many different things, what social media tools uh, do you use to kind of keep it being checked? Both things, like how about tools do you use? One of the coolest ones that I've recently found was, it's called Missing Letter, and that's Missing, L-E-T-T-R. And Missing Letter, what it does is if, as you make a blog post, it automatically reads that blog post, and then it breaks up a bunch of different posts and we'll post them over the course of a year now, through Twitter or Facebook. Magic! Yeah, <laughs> and so like, it will pull the pictures out and you have to do some fine tuning with it because it'll grab stuff out of the sidebar. Sometimes like, and it's not all automatic. You have to go through and prove which ones, but it makes it really simple to do. And you you can put in code words. So like, you want to say like, <laughs> one went out the other day and it said like, Want to learn more about Akron music? And then in the picture, it, it'll do like quote pictures. So it's kind of like a quote that they, it pulls out of the text to, to, to highlight it. And this one said, sign up for our email. And I was like, how did I miss that? Right. But if you know that in the sidebar, there's a headline that says sign up for our email, you can put in a word, you can put it in and say like, ignore, sign up for our email, ignore. And it takes some fine to me, but it will program out a, a post like every month or something like that and throw it back to to your blog so that one of the big things a problem with Facebook Twitter and Instagram is that it's fast you know Twitter is so fast you got a couple of hours where that tweet is relevant 
Facebook, you got two days. Instagram, you know, right now it's kind of it, it's it moves not as fast as Twitter, but pretty fast. And there's nothing that keeps people in the long run going back to your website except, and this is something that not a lot of people use when they think about businesses or even think about in terms of this. Pinterest is the one social media website that is in it for the long game. Because when you do a search on Google and you look at the Google images, there are tons and tons of images that come up via Pinterest. And when you click on them, eventually you find your way to a website. So what you want to do is if you do a blog post and you put pictures into your blog post, you should have a Pinterest board that includes the pictures from that, from that blog post. Because over time, as, as you start to build up those boards on Pinterest, and people start to follow it as they repin stuff from you, they are going to then eventually find your, your blog and your website because of Pinterest. And it may be a year or more down the road. And that's one of the, like, Pinterest, you don't see, a, you see spikes from Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And not so much Instagram. Facebook and Twitter, you see the spikes. Instagram, because you don't really have the links. Instagram is more about familiarity with your brand. But Pinterest, you don't see that spike early on. But over time, it's sending more and more people to your website. And once you can get them to your website, like I say, and I want to talk to you all about pixels. Um, if you have a pixel on your website that says, hey, remember whoever comes, then you can turn around and say, like, they made it to my website, now I want to run a Facebook ad that's only showing the people who have been to the website. You can then turn around, like, Maybe it's someone brand new to you who found a photo through Pinterest that ends up at your website and they clicked around and was like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, I learned something new. And then when they get back to Facebook, there's the ad saying like, hey, you like what you saw on my, on my, um, on my website, you know, click this link. Now you got it. You got an opportunity to sell to them. So the idea behind the pixels, and if you um, just search, do a Facebook search pixels, and it's pretty easy to do. It's a small piece of code that you're going to put in the header of your website, and it's just going to collect the data on people that's coming through. But there's also a, oh my goodness, there's Google has a, I believe it's called a tag bucket, because you're going to need a pixel. If you want to run ads to Facebook, Twitter, um, any of these other things, you have to put these codes so that if, if you've noticed, if you go to a website, like you're looking at a new pair of shoes, and those shoes kind of follow you around the internet, you go to a website, there's a banner, and the shoes are there, and how does it happen? And there's a little piece of code that's tracking you, obviously, and it knows what you've done. Google has, I believe it's called the tag bucket, and I will, uh, I will find out for sure and I'll give that information to Kevin so he can get it out to you all. But this, instead of putting a piece of code for Facebook, for Twitter, for your banner ads, you put this one piece of code that, that's a Google um, a Google code, and then the back end through your Google Analytics, you put in all of your other um, tags, pixels, any of those things, and it's all held in one space, so you don't have to keep going into your web code and updating it every time you want to change. If you want to track a particular item, you can do it all from this back end. So that's very helpful and that I mean, that's getting your targeting as close to your customer as you can. Um, and those things are huge. So it's weird to think that Pinterest is important, but it is. It, it, it helps in the long run, and it, gets, it helps to get people to your website. And then once you get them to your website, you want to be tracking who's coming to your website so that you can sell, you can put an ad in front of them because you know they're interested because they've been to your website. So the importance of writing a blog is that you have content, that and content and pictures, and then you want to share those pictures, of course, through all of your social media channels. But make sure you put them. Make sure you've got a Pinterest board that's all about, you know, or multiple Pinterest boards. Um, yeah, talk about different things that you, that you're doing, and and then get them to your website, get them to your blog, because you don't want to just you don't want your social media to be all about, hey, um, here's what I have on sale at my website. You want to give content so that people feel like, oh, I'm, I'm learning something and it's more shareable. People aren't likely to share an ad 
people are more likely to share content. And once they share that content, of course, they're spreading your word. You're getting more people to that website. So you need that content on your website so that you can turn around and get a very effective ad in front of somebody. So what's the future of Unbox? I mean, you mean still, you have you not even a year, so you has been a year. I have been here eight months. Eight months. So what's the future? But the next couple of years, I mean, for what type of things would you Chris like to do with Unbox? Um, we would really, we see the opportunity for this to work in other cities. If we can make it work here, we can work in other cities. In fact, it wasn't shortly after we got it started, and we had kind of talked about this, but you know, the focus was on background. But shortly after we got it started, we got an email from someone in Charleston, South, South Carolina, asking about the franchise. So we hope one day to be able to duplicate this in other cities, and ideally what, what we'll first do is try it out in some other night cities, and then from there, kind of say like, well, you know, once once you once we better understand the process of what does it take, how do you work with, you know, what best works for us, take all of our best practices and apply them to another city, and see how how it responds there, and then from there we can build a toolkit that we can sell as a franchise to, to help. And like I said, it's going to work best in the city where people have a lot of pride in the city. And that was the one great thing about Akron. Is Akron folks love Akron and, and love to show off Akron. And that has been a bigger piece of our marketing than anything else is that people who love Akron get excited about this and then turn around and share it with their friends. Right. And uh, finally, you, you said a quote a long time ago, uh, you said, dance like no one is watching. Basically, you know, doesn't matter if you dance or not dance, just get out there and dance for it, just enjoy yourself. Um, what made you decide to become a DJ? You know, I mean, you know, because I like the dance, but I always like the idea of the DJ. Like, DJ is like fantastic because you're kind of like the conductor, you know, you, kind of, you don't have to dance. You like, you know, people come to you, but, and you need to play some cool music. But what made you decide to become a DJ? Um, I actually, so I, once upon a time, I worked in, I worked as a data analyst and a database programmer. That's not like a DJ path. <laughs> <laughs> and I I was working at the Ford World Headquarters in Detroit. And then I left there and I started working for a tobacco company in Georgia. And I was miserable. And then all my life I've loved computers, I've loved technology. I started programming computers at the age of 10. I, Back in the days, of like the five and a quarter floppies, the big, big old floppies, like that was what I used to save programs on. And I, um, one day I was sitting in my cubicle, just kind of looking around. I was like, if I have to spend thirty years of my life sitting in the cubicle, I'm gonna go crazy. It's like, what do, what would I do? And my question to myself was, if I had all of the money I needed to live on. What would I do? And I was like, I would play my records from my record collection. I'd listen to my records. And I was like, well, how do I make money listening to records? And I was like, I'll become a DJ. And it was, I went broke. It was a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> or it's, it wasn't so much that it was a bad idea because doing that got me where I am now. Like the path that I took was, you know, the DJ, the promotion of myself, the promotion of the arts and music scene, which led me to. You know all of these connections, which led me into marketing. I started working for a, you know, a restaurant group, and then all of those connections that I made along the way, and all of the what I learned along the way. One day, Chris says, "Hey, you want to do this?" So I couldn't have gotten there without doing that. But I think, you know, looking back, if I could have done it a different way, if I could have DJ and had a steady job at the same time, it would have been a whole lot better. Well, how old were you when you made that decision? Um, probably about twenty. Wow, that's late for it. Like you be DJ, you kind of college, or you kind of you kind of you kind of had epiphany. But again, like you said, if you didn't make that decision, you wouldn't be where you are today. Right. Yeah. So I um I had always kind of like I used to say I always wanted to be a DJ, but I never I, I knew my parents were not going to pull me up the money for a DJ system. Right. So once I had my own career and I could buy, I bought all this DJ equipment that I had wanted all my life and. All I did was sit around and play records and make mixes, and then one day I was like, I can do this. I'm, you know, I'm decent enough. I can, I can be a DJ, and there are no DJs in this town. So, so that, that's how that came about. And um, you know, the, like I say, I, if I can, if I think back, I do it differently. I would, but I, I, I probably would. But 
also, like I said, there was, I would never want to give up what I learned in that process all along the way. And what type of equipment do you use? Uh, Technique 1200 turntables. Um, I, I have a rain mixer and I use Serato Scratch for, to control the MP3s through boot turntables because I don't want to like, I used to carry records all the time and after up a flight of stairs, yeah, kiss do, do a show with something a flight of stairs for a year, and you'd be like, no. But, you know, when digital DJs came about, I was the same way. I was kind of, I don't want to do it. And one day, I, I, I had a friend who had it, and I kept watching him. Like, he didn't have to carry all of the records I did. And I was like, oh, I think I'll do that. I think I'll make that switch. But, you know, it's still fun every now and then to break out the records. And when I'm at home, you know, I still, now, actually, it's better in the fact that my records really are my collector's pieces and I get to listen to them as opposed to wearing them out, putting them in and out of boxes and, and pulling them in and out of the sleeves like I used to. You know, now I can sit down and play them and, you know, wear out a digital copy as opposed to wearing out my, my vinyl. All right. Well, that's uh, Roger Bruno, everybody. Let's give him a hand. We're going to open it up for questions. And we have a surprise. Whoever has the best question, question will get a the March box from Unbox Sacra. Your own box. So think hard for a question. So anybody have any questions? Gilmatic or 36 Chambers? 36 Chambers. <laughs> yeah, 36 Chambers. 36 Chambers was, it, it was important. When I think about it, I, I know exactly where I am at the time. Like Gilmatic for me was, around that same time, but it was more in the background. Like, I love Wu-Tang. I went crazy over Wu-Tang when it first came out. Um, and, now, now when I look at it though, I think like, Nas's catalog is incredible, while Wu-Tang is, is here and there, but Nas, Nas is a bit more solid. It is. Can't yeah. give him credit. Yeah, right, exactly. Anybody else have any questions? Chris, what is the best resource to keep track of all of these machinations with Facebook, with the algorithms, it's, so that you can at least know, you know? There's not a good resource for it. What your struggle is, I guess. They, they keep they keep the algorithm so hidden that no one knows. There's nothing out there that says like you should be doing this, and all it really is. Is people testing it to find out what works, and then reading blog posts. I listen to, I listen to a blog, a podcast called Social Media Examiner, and they do a good job. That Social Media Examiner, first of all, they will tell you. They do a segment at the very beginning where they say, "Hey, I ran across this new app that in social media. Here's what it does." So it's constantly saying, "Like, here are some other resources that you can use that you can try out. Maybe black, maybe you don't." But then they'll interview people across the spectrum, maybe one week you'll hear somebody from Twitter, somebody from Facebook, somebody who's a Pinterest specialist, somebody who's in the Instagram. And a lot of times those conversations will say like, well, we've noticed this about the changes that have made, that, that have been made. But Facebook never releases anything. They keep it close to the, close to their chest as, in terms of what they actually do. Um, so it's a matter of you know finding the marketing blogs and social media blogs out there and reading them and finding out you know kind of what everybody is thinking and then testing it yourself to see you know you feel like there's been a change and lately something has happened like there, there's been a little bit of difference in them in probably about the last month I think you used to be able to log in as your page and then you would have the page would have its own feed. Yeah. That you and because you could, you know, you could just pick up what you needed for that feed. But now you can't. You can only log in as yourself personally, and then you have to go through all that. Everybody else has seen that too. I really, I ran across the the feed for the page once since since that change happened, and I couldn't figure out how I did it. You know, I clicked something and didn't know I had done it, and all of a sudden I was like, oh. Here it is, but I've never been able to figure out how to get back to it since then. But yeah, I agree. I, I know exactly what you mean. It used to be really easy to figure out the the, the other pages your page followed if you wanted to share stuff from them, um, the content from them. And like I said, now you kind of 
kind of have to keep a middle note of who I want to go look at and share from that page or hope you run across it in your own timeline, which, is, like you said, is always busy and you never know, or even if you're going to see it at all in your timeline. But, yeah, there's no easy resource to see what changes the Facebook is made to the algorithm. Sorry. Facebook is one of those weird things. It's one of the few, you know, meet the platforms where you actually have to have a personal page first, and then you can have, or yes. you, you know, you have to have personal identity, and then you can have business pages. Right. So you don't have to do that on Twitter. You don't have to do that anywhere else. So it's almost like you have to be who you are, and you have to be following everything that your business is doing anyway. So, for, unfortunately, and especially now that you they get rid of the business pages. You know, there is no feed now. Right. You kind of have to do that for all the pages that you... And it's... I find it interesting that, like you said, like you don't have to do that with all the other pages. And you would think that, that that would be a downside. But Facebook is it's always strong. It's the, it's the most used. And you, you hope that... I, I, I really hoped at one point that Twitter was going to was going to kind of step up and become something more. And I've heard rumors that because Google Plus failed, that Google is interested in buying Twitter. Twitter is like falling off such hard times that you may see some sort of combination of Google Plus and Twitter. But I don't know. Like that's it's it's in such a rumor phase. That I don't know if that's going to happen or not. And I, I have no idea what you know what changes will come with that. So. Here's hoping that some something will come along that's a bit more effective than Facebook that we can get to one day that to help us better reach the customers that, that follow us on social media. I noticed that you, for both of those entities, Twitter and Facebook, you can create lists that can sort of take the place of some of that the feeds, but um, you have to you know, get out when. Kind of a and there, there are, it's really hard, to, I, I haven't used the Facebook list because it's, it, it seems kind of clunky to me. Twitter is very hard, like you have to, or, you know, you kind of have to build those lists almost from inception of the account for them to, to make it easy on you or else, you, you know, you have to go back and find like how far down someone is in your, your um, Twitter followers before you can get to them. Like you have to go through almost the whole list and one by one click it. But there are a few apps out there that help you better manage Twitter lists. And right now I cannot think of the names of them. But I will, that's another thing that I'll give you if you keep up with Kevin Lockett here. Um, I'm gonna, I'll give him the information on the Google tag bucket as well as the tag manager. Tag manager, thank you. Um, Google Tag Manager, as well as some of these apps that I've run across for Twitter lists. Does anybody else have any questions? No, yeah, keep going. Keep going. Sorry. You really want this box? I can feel the energy. <laughs> uh, I was probably for quantity, not quality. But, um, what's your rule of thumb when you're writing a blog? Like 500 words, five paragraphs? Um, I actually don't mind a long blog if it's. Um, You know, if, if you're telling a really in-depth in-depth story, I'm I'm not a person who will I, I will read read the a long blog. Not everyone does. I think at the most, if you, if you know your audience and you know they are the type of people that are going to read something long, at the most you want to do 700, 500 words. It's really short and quick, but like I also feel like 500 words limits you. I don't know if you get it. I always feel like I can't get enough information across the 500 words. But around the 700 word mark seems to be a sweet spot in terms of how much information I can get into it and it being a very short read. So I would say 700 at the most, unless you know, I don't know, like be, Summit Art Space, uh, your, I, I would imagine, you said Summit Art Space, didn't you? Okay, so I would imagine very artistic minded people, would they be open to a longer read? Or do you know yet? You have no idea? Mm -hmm. I, would, I would test it out. Like, yeah. do, do a longer, maybe you want to do a thousand word piece and see, like leave some sort of link towards the end to see how many people make it to the bottom. Um, 
and see how many people click that link. And um, that's the easiest way to tell. Like, do do one, do one at five hundred, do one at seven hundred, do one at a thousand. Put a link at the end and see who makes it to to those links. Do a different link in each one so that you can track and and figure out. You know, but I my guess is that you're gonna find like maybe your your followers don't mind a long read. Anything else? Anybody else? All right. Well, even though I did enjoy the Nas Wu Tang question, because I'm a hip hop head, she mentioned algorithms. So, algorithms win. What are these? Let me know. Go to at Code Akron, at Kevin Lockett. Tell me what you think about this. Go to unboxakron.com and sign up for a subscription. Yep. Um, I've been tweeting questions out while I'm sitting here. I was also tweeting out questions beforehand. So, uh, there's some Code Akron stuff out there. So, check that out. And uh, thank you everybody for showing up. If you have any questions for me afterwards, I can be reached at roger.riddle at gmail.com.